good morning. Glad to, uh, glad to be with you uh, today to continue our series in Luke's Gospel. We've made it all the way to chapter 17. We're nearing a, a, a break point here in Luke, and I don't know whether it'll work out. Sometimes you have to be ready for unanticipated things, but Lord willing, we'll get to the end of the section uh, here in Luke, which is in chapter 19, basically, basically when Jesus arrives at Jerusalem uh, towards the, the very end of the calendar year. We're, I mean, believe it or not, we're not that far away from that, right? It's October, and so we are uh, in the last quarter of the calendar year, and uh, we'll take a breather for a while from Luke before we get into Jesus' time in Jerusalem prior to his arrest and crucifixion and, and whatnot. Um, let me say thank you to my son, Benjamin, for bringing the family conference testimony today. So, uh, as I said last week, it's good to hear from some other folks besides yours truly or uh, my partner in crime over here uh, about the family conference. And so, uh, thankful for, uh, for what Ben said. And uh, we are including in the family conference this year, we will have child care for uh, preschool and down, but for elementary age and up, the subject matter is quite appropriate for uh, elementary age up through youth, and so we are including them in the family conference, and I think there's some really wonderful things they can learn, and uh, these uh, it's going to be brought by some brothers who have families of their own, and they can share their own experience and how they've been on mission for Christ with their own families. So uh, anyway, the registration deadline formally is today, uh, but I've heard that Mary is nicer than me, and she would uh, she will take your registration after today. But let's try, as Mark said, let's try to get them in as soon as we can because we need to plan meals. One of the features of our family conference is the food, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, we can. That's all right. We can aim in. That's good. Yeah, we have good meals here, so uh, we need to know how many to plan for. All right, I want to take us to a time of prayer, and um, as we go before uh, the Lord here in this time together, we'll silently pray for one minute, and I want us to, uh, th this is um, speaking of the kingdom today, and largely uh, the, 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 this te Jesus' teaching on the kingdom is focused on the king, the king of that kingdom, Jesus Christ. Our theme for the year here at Rikers Ridge has been thirsting for God. And we sang the song this morning, Pastor Mark brought us, As the deer uh, uh, pants for the water, so my soul longs after, after thee or after you. And uh, my friend, that if, if we were thirsty for God or thirstier for God, I'm telling you that takes care of so many different spiritual issues that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we want to continue to pray for that. So during this time this morning, as we pray silently for a minute, pray that God will prick your own heart, uh, that you will be, even the message this morning in some way, shape, or form, will foster more and more of a thirst for God in your life. And for us as a, as a community of believers, that we together would thirst for God fervently. So let's pray uh, towards that end, and then I'll preach the sermon. Father, we need you. I'm sure most of us gathered here today would acknowledge that at least at a surface level. But when we thirst for you, as the psalmist says here in the song that we sang, we're more aware of that need for you. 
So even now, Lord, would you remind us of how desperately we need you and not just how much we need you, uh, but how graciously you fulfill uh, those needs in us. You are what we need. You are who we need. Even now, as, as we dive into your word, give us ears to hear for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Elvis Presley died about almost exactly a year before I was born. So he died in August of 1977, and I was born in August of 1978. So I never got to see him in concert. I'm sure that would have been very entertaining. And if you're here this morning and you actually saw Elvis perform live, I would love to hear about that sometime after uh, the service this morning. I assume that most of you know that Elvis was called the king of rock and roll. He was often referred to as that. He was certainly an incredibly popular figure in his day. And you've probably also heard this phrase used in some context before, Elvis has left the building. I'm sure most of you have heard that. Well, do you know the origin of that phrase? It, it isn't hard to guess, of course, that it was first used at one of his concerts. But there was a particular reason why an announcer named Horace Haas Logan first uttered those words at a, a show in Shreveport, Louisiana on December 15, 1956. Uh, there's an article written by Jordan Runtag of People Magazine says the following, and I quote uh, on the origin of that phrase, the 10,000 teenagers packed into a cramped building in the Shreveport fairgrounds that December night screamed throughout Presley's entire set. Unfortunately, bizarre scheduling practices made him only the third performer on a packed bill, and the shrieks for an encore drowned out the next unlikely arti unlucky artist. Can you imagine if you were that, the fourth person on that set? You might as well just give up. You might as well just put your stuff aside, whatever. They're, they're not listening to you. When it became clear that Presley would not return to the stage, many in the crowd made a dash for the door, hoping to catch a glimpse of the king making his exit. That's when the show's announcer, Horace Haas Logan, uttered his immortal words. All right, all right, Elvis has left the building, he boomed over the PA. I've told you absolutely straight up to this point, you know that. He has left the building. He left the stage and went out the, the back with the policeman, and he is now gone. Please take your seats. That was the origin of Elvis has left the building. Now that phrase, I guess because it kind of caught on, would later be used regularly at his concerts, and then eventually it would permeate the wider culture, so that if you're like me and you're too young to have ever heard Elvis in concert, you've probably heard that phrase at some point. Well, this morning's text is obviously not about the king of rock and roll. We're not, I'm not going to come up here and give a lecture on Elvis this morning. But it is about the King of Kings, Jesus, and His kingdom. And as the title of the sermon implies this morning, there are two primary time aspects when we're talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, and we've covered this before in our series in Luke. So let me just summarize that very briefly as we begin this morning. There is what theologians call the already or the present aspect of the kingdom of God, which began when Jesus came for his earthly ministry around roughly 2,000 years ago. So there's this present aspect. The king has come, and with him, his kingdom. That's the present aspect or the already aspect. But the king has left the building in a sense. Uh, the, the end of Luke's gospel and the beginning of Luke part 2, which we know as the book of Acts, record uh, Jesus' ascension. And so Jesus has left in a sense. However, as today's passage indicates, the king is coming back. Jesus is going to return. That is what Bible scholars call the not yet or the future aspect uh, of the kingdom of God. Jesus will be returning at some point. He will come back. So why does that matter? Right? Why does that matter? Why should the return of Christ be important to us? Well, just from today's text, we can see very clearly that Christ's return will be sudden and it will involve swift and terrible judgment on all who are not ready. Which means that in a broad sense, this passage is a call to readiness. 
It's a call to readiness, and I'll explain more what that means uh, in more detail as we work through the passage. Now, I want to be clear here at the, the outset of the sermon, uh, buyer beware, I guess, uh, even though, uh, whatever, I'm just up here preaching. I, I want to be clear about this. This passage is not a full and complete exposition on eschatology or the doctrine of last things, or as people like to speak of it, as end times. This is not an exposition on all end times things. Uh, That became more and more clear to me as I studied the passage. Jesus is making some particular points about his kingdom and about his return. Uh, However, he's not giving a ton of detail here about timing and the overall sequence of events. He's not talking about those things. He, he does provide more explanation when we get to chapter 21, so we will we'll deal with some of those things there. But let, let me just try to explain this a bit more, and there's reasons why I'm doing this. Um, if you look at this passage that Pastor Mark just read, there are a number of things that we don't see here in the text. We don't see any mention of the tribulation. We don't see anything about the millennium. We don't see uh, anything about uh, the land or anything of that. Uh, There's lots of parts of the bigger picture that we don't see from just this passage. Jesus is making a particular point. So let me give you an analogy here. Let's say I decided to describe Pastor Mark this morning. Uh, We could have open mic time and we could describe Pastor Mark. What do you think about that? Be fun? All right. What color is your shirt, brother? I'm colorblind. What color is that? All right, dark green. All right, so if I was to describe Pastor Mark this morning, I could talk about his dark green shirt, or I could talk about his tie, or I could talk about his shoes, or the pants he's wearing, or his glasses, or I could talk about uh, his stunning physique and rugged good looks, or whatever you want to say this morning. I could talk about any of those things. But if I choose to talk about one of those things, then it's out of bounds to say, well, wait a minute. Why didn't you talk about his shoes? Well, I was talking about his shirt. Why didn't you talk about his uh, his glasses? Well, I was talking about his uh, the the how much I admired the shine on his head or something like that, right? Um, And so my point this morning is this: Uh, I'm not going to be breaking out charts this morning and things about end time stuff. And so if that's what you're looking for, you're going to be disappointed. My agenda this morning is, as it always is, is to preach the text that's before us. And the text that's before us is Luke chapter 17. It will give clarity on some issues, but sometimes you're, you're looking at one particular aspect of something and you're not necessarily seeing the whole. That's what we're going to be doing this morning uh, if you don't like it, you can complain that 2601 North Rikers Ridge Road, Madison, Indiana, 47250, attention Mary Harden, and she would be glad to receive your complaints today. You can tell her I said that. All right. All right, so we've got six lessons that we're going to take away from the passage this morning, so let's dive in together this morning. Let's look at the first lesson, and this is the big picture lesson. The kingdom of God has come and is coming. The kingdom of God has come and is coming. Now, hopefully, I've conveyed by now, I've been told that I repeat myself a lot, that some of that is by design, some of it's probably just effects of the fall. Some of it is by design, though, because I want us to get the picture that when we look at a passage or we look at a passage in its context, we need to see not just the little details, but we need to see the whole, right? We need to see the big picture. And so if I'm looking at this passage, there's really kind of two main parts in this passage that are framed by who it is that Jesus is addressing, his audience. So the first couple of verses there, in verses 20 and 21, uh, Jesus is addressing the Pharisees. He gets a question from the Pharisees and he's speaking to them, and there's a particular point that he's making in that. The rest of the passage, which is the bulk of the verses, Jesus is addressing to his disciples, and he's speaking about the kingdom Uh, there as well. However, in the first part, he's speaking of the kingdom in its present sense. The kingdom has come. It's in your midst, uh, as it says there. The second part of the passage, he's clearly speaking in future terms. And so there's a break there by the audience, but he's talking about the kingdom in two different aspects of it. Maybe you could say one side is the heads and one side is the tails, but Luke brings them together. Here's something for us to think about. There's nothing in the passage that indicates that these two things happen sequentially. 
right? It's quite possible that Jesus, at some point in his earthly ministry, was speaking to the Pharisees about this subject of the kingdom, and he said, the kingdom is in your midst. Then at some other point, Jesus is addressing the disciples, and he's saying these things about the kingdom being in the future. We don't know whether these things happen back to back or not, but what we do know is that the gospel writer Luke chose to take these two things and put them together which means that he probably had a reason for doing that. And part of it, I believe, is for us to see this big picture lesson that's there before us, that the kingdom of God has two aspects. It has come, and it is coming. Uh, He did that for a reason. Now, we're going to move on in just a minute to our second lesson, but I want to see for a moment, I want to put back up the definition there uh, of the kingdom of God. Don't, Don't panic. Uh, there's no test on that. You know, we should give tests. I, as a pastor, I would love to do that. I would love it if we just had exams periodically. Like, let's see who's really listening to the sermon today. Like, get back. Oh, man, we're going to have that curve's going to have to move way down. Right? Somebody would bust the curve and everybody would be upset with that person. Uh, at least one person is listening, I'm sure. What's the point in bringing this up? Well, if you've been here in our series in Luke, you may have seen this uh, before because I've shared it a few times. This is one of the, it, for me personally, this has been one of the more helpful definitions of the kingdom of God because we see the kingdom of God throughout the Gospels. Jesus is speaking the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, and I think many times we just kind of casually use that language, but we don't understand what it actually means. So my point in showing us this It's to say, look, this helps us understand what the kingdom means. Well, it's really long and complicated. That's fine. Either write it down or take a picture of it with your phone, uh, and then you can look at it and kind of chew on it later. It says, the kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God manifested in the person and work of Christ. In other words, Jesus is the king of the kingdom, and he's kind of the, 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 the initiator of the kingdom. It's all really kind of revolving around him creating a people over whom he reigns. And so when Jesus came the first time, he, he was uh, bringing disciples along with him, and he's kind of building this spiritual kingdom through these disciples who are, are then uh, accepting Jesus' reign and issuing in a realm or realms in which the power of his reign is realized. And so the reason why this definition is helpful, I believe, is because it shows kind of the present and the future aspects of this. When Jesus came in his, his, his earthly ministry, this began. And so people are coming to faith, they're coming to Christ, and they're submitting to the, the, the reign, the sovereign rule of God, and there's, the church is formed. Now, church is not the kingdom, but it's, it's kind of an outpost of the kingdom, and we're beginning to see people who are willingly embracing the rule of God. In its fullness, though, this hasn't really come yet. The future aspect of the kingdom of God, when Jesus comes back and then everything will be set right. All God's people, uh, we could go on and on about this, but the, the, the bottom line is there is a future time in which Jesus will be reigning in a more complete sense in that it will be out in the open more, if that makes sense. Uh, theologians are terrible about uh, being nitpicky about terms and whatnot, so I'm trying to be careful kind of on the fly while explaining this, but the point is, I think if you will chew on this definition, it can be helpful to think about what the kingdom of God actually is. All right, I want to jump to the second lesson from the text this morning, and that's when we start getting into the verses themselves, not just looking at the big picture. So look with me at verse 20. It says, now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And so some Pharisees apparently decided to ask Jesus a question at some point related to the timing of the kingdom of God. When is the kingdom of God coming? Now, generally, the Pharisees in the gospel accounts are hostile to Jesus. We've seen that over and over again, generally, but not always. And there's no indication in this particular text that there's some trick up their sleeve or whatever, because a lot of times the gospel writers will show us when they've got a trick up their sleeve, they're going to try to do something to Jesus. They're just asking him a question. Now, part of what this indicates is that unlike another group of religious folks at that time, which we've seen or we will see, the Sadducees, 
the Sadducees did not really believe in the supernatural. So they didn't believe in the resurrection. Uh, There were lots of things that the Sadducees did not believe in. The Pharisees did believe in those things. They did believe in the possibility of miracles. They did believe in angels. They did believe in the resurrection. And they obviously believed in the coming of the kingdom. The problem is that their hearts were hard. And so quite often they misinterpreted or distorted the very scriptures that they claimed to love and observe. And so the Pharisees would often, when it came to things like the kingdom, they they would blur Jesus' first and second coming because they had this vision of kind of uh, this this, uh, military conqueror who would come and conquer Rome and free them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. The the sad and ironic thing is that they, they missed the coming of the king who was literally standing in front of them. Just as much as I'm standing in front of you right now, in the, in the days of the first century, Jesus is literally speaking to them, just like I'm talking to you right now, and they totally missed it. It's not that they didn't think Jesus was there, but they didn't recognize who Jesus was. They, they missed the kingdom. They, they did not recognize the king. And so they, they missed the essence of the kingdom. And so Jesus is basically telling them that in response to their question, that, that guys, you've missed it. They are looking for outward actions that can be observed. Uh, and he says that the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or, or there it is. And so if they're looking for a political type of kingdom with boundaries, there it is. Jesus is saying, you're missing the kingdom that is here in your midst. They, 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 they've missed it. King Jesus has come, and sadly, because their hearts are hard, they missed that. It wasn't what they expected or what they wanted, and they missed King Jesus. Now, scholars debate the translation at the end of verse 21. So your English translation may say something like, the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, The New American Standard says, in your midst. Some others say something similar. Now, the, the Greek word there could very well be translated within you. The, 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 ver- the word could be within. However, theologically, that does not make sense. Why would Jesus be saying to a group of Pharisees, hard-hearted folks, that the kingdom of God is within them? Why would he say that? Well, again, it doesn't make sense. And so uh, an alternate translation, which I believe is better, is that he's saying it's in the midst of you. It's among you. You're failing to see it. Your hardness of heart has blinded your eyes and you're failing to see that the kingdom of God is here in a very real sense because the king is standing in front of you. That's what Jesus was communicating to them. Well, not much has really changed in that respect, to be, to be honest with you. I'm not saying that there's tons of people who are anxiously awaiting the kingdom of God as the Pharisees claim to be doing. However, there are many people who have missed the fact that God's kingdom is here in a sense because they don't recognize King Jesus. They don't don't acknowledge who Jesus is. They don't understand who he is. And so they too have missed the fact that the kingdom of God has come. They've missed the significance of King Jesus. And maybe you're listening this morning and you're in that boat. You don't understand all this Jesus hubbub. What's all this stuff about? And you miss the significance of Jesus Christ coming in his earthly ministry and what he's still doing today uh, in his world. If that's you today, I don't mean to be overly harsh or unkind, but if that is you and you really don't understand what the big deal is about Jesus, what I would say is that you are spiritually blind. That much like the Pharisees, uh, something has blinded your eyes and you're not seeing What's the most important, the most important thing in all everything, and that is King Jesus. And so, don't be like the Pharisees, friend. Don't miss the fact that the King has come and He's bringing people into His kingdom. Now, I want to get to the third lesson this morning from the passage. No one can miss the future coming of the kingdom with its King. No one can miss the future coming of the kingdom with its King. And so we see this lesson in verses 22 to 25 there in the passage. And he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there, look here, 
Do not go away and do not run after them. For just like the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And so Luke is, again, he's presenting that contrast between the kingdom in its present sense and the kingdom in the future. In its present sense, many people miss it. Many people miss it. The Pharisees missed it. Lots of people, maybe even today, as I said, you're missing it. And so don't, they don't understand. But in the future, it absolutely cannot be missed. Now let's walk through and explain what we mean there by these verses. So in verse 22, Jesus is telling his disciples that a time will come when they will long to see one of the days of, son of the Son of Man, but they won't. What does that mean? Well, part of what will help us here is to look back again at what the title Son of Man refers to. What it, Jesus often refers to himself as the Son of Man. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, uh, there's a mention, a reference to the Son of Man. Uh, and this is what we see there in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel writes, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So when Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, he's, he's drawing our attention back to that in, from the book of Daniel. And so effectively, what Jesus is telling them, in, in his disciples in the passage, is that at some point in the future, from the time at which he's speaking, they will be longing to see one of the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Because of the hardships that they are enduring in a fallen world, because of the persecution that they are facing as Christ followers, they will long for the future when the Son of Man will come and set all things right. And yet Jesus says to them that they would not see that time. They would not see that time. Now Jesus always keeps His promises. Somebody should have amen that. Jesus always keeps his promises. Okay, I mean, it's, it's kind of fake when I have to manufacture it like that, right? You guys ought to listen a little closer. That's fine. We'll have like a cue or something. Amen, amen. Jesus always keeps his promises. And so even though these, he told the disciples, you won't see these days, he still has not come back. But my friends, we can bank on it. He is coming back. Jesus will return just as he promised. And so even though those disciples didn't see it, we have not seen it. We look uh, patiently, we wait, and we look to his return. Then verse 23 is a warning to the disciples. Don't be fooled by those who would claim that somehow Jesus has secretly come back, as if the days of the Son of Man have arrived. Or uh, as one commentator pointed out, the, these words, this warning was very appropriate. My friends, how many cult leaders throughout the last 20, cent or, yeah, 20 centuries have claimed somehow to be someone, uh, some sort of Messiah? They were either Jesus uh, or they were claiming to be someone else. Far too many people have been led astray throughout the last 2,000 years by these folks that would claim somehow something that they're the Messiah. Now, verse 24 then provides the reason why Jesus' disciples need not be fooled by charlatans who would either claim to be Jesus or have some secret knowledge of his return. When the king comes back to rule, it will be like lightning on one side of the sky is seen on the other side of the sky. You cannot miss it. I grew up in the area that some call the lightning capital of the world. There's tons of light. There's a reason why the hockey team's called the Tampa Bay Lightning. The light, you, you see it regularly. In fact, growing up, they're warning you, like, don't hang out on the golf course when it starts lightning or whatever. You don't want to be the tallest object around. When lightning hits, you see it. It's, it's, it's bright. It's vi the whole sky lights up. And what Jesus is saying is that in that day, it will be plainly evident for all to see. So don't be fooled by those who would tell you secrets about, oh, look over here, here he is, and whatnot. 
Now, before that could happen, verse 25 says, first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now, that is exactly what will happen to Jesus when he gets to his destination. We've already seen time and time again here in this part of Luke from chapter 9, again, going through about chapter 19, that Jesus has a final destination. It may be a meandering journey. He's going this way and that, but eventually his end destination is Jerusalem. He knows exactly what will take place in Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be crucified. He knows what will take place. He knows, as the verse says, that he will suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Those things must come first, and certainly from the perspective of the people that Jesus was actually speaking to, that would come first. That would take place before these other events would take place. You remember Where's Waldo? Remember that? Where's Waldo? So some of you, maybe you're like, oh, why'd you bring that up? Man, my kids used to love those books. It says, Where's Waldo? Uh, did we, were we able to get that up? Look at that. If you don't know Where's Waldo, there's Where's Waldo. It's this guy with the cool red and white shirt, and uh, you, you, they're in puzzle books. And in those puzzle books, uh, it would have this elaborate scene with all these little figures, and somewhere in the midst of that is Waldo. Now, there's usually other things for you to search for, but Waldo is the key, and you're looking for Waldo and all this stuff, and it's very difficult to see him. Now, if we think about the kingdom of God in its present and its future aspects, we can say that in one sense, it is kind of like Where's Waldo? But in another sense, it is not like Where's Waldo at all. So in the present sense, it is incredibly easy to miss the kingdom of God. In fact, the, the Pharisees, though they were experts in, they, they could have recited all sorts of Old Testament scripture to you. In spite of that, they missed it, even though it was right in front of their face. You, you can stare at a Where's Waldo book for a long time, and you're not gonna, you may not see the little guy on there or whatever, even though it's literally right in front of your face. In some ways, the kingdom is like that. It takes spiritual eyes to see it. A transformed heart, which can only happen through faith in Christ, the King of the kingdom. And so he opens our eyes spiritually. We become citizens of that kingdom when we heed the gospel call to repent and believe. And so apart from that, like where's Waldo, we may miss it. But in the future, when Jesus comes back to reign, what Jesus is telling us here is that it will be nothing like where's Waldo. Right? Jesus comes back, it's like lightning flashing. And you can see it across the sky. We cannot miss it. That is what Jesus is trying to say. So don't be fooled, friends, by those who try to impress you with their supposedly super secret insights on Jesus' future coming. Now, I realize again, I'll say this again, we're not covering certain aspects of the return of Christ this morning because they're not in the passage. This passage does not in any way contradict 1 Thessalonians 4, which we read earlier, or anything like that. But sadly, there are many out there who would, who would uh, proclaim that they have these secret insights on the coming of Christ. But don't be fooled by that stuff, right? Trust God's Word. That is what we're looking for. I don't want to oversimplify things, but again, we need to be careful here. I don't want us to miss the point of the text. The point of the text is that we don't need to be worried that we're somehow going to miss the ultimate coming of the kingdom of God. Right? You're not going to miss it. They, they, we're not going to just, oh my goodness, I, I missed it that Jesus, what? We're not going to miss it. Now, you may not be ready for it, and that is a part of the text, and that actually brings us to our next lesson, because this is very important for us to see from this passage. The future coming of the kingdom involves sudden, unexpected, catastrophic judgment. Sudden, unexpected, catastrophic judgment. So, this is the message being conveyed in verses 26 to 30. Uh, in, in verses 26 to 30, Jesus brings up two Old Testament examples. Now, I'm going to talk about those specific examples, but I want to make one observation before I do that. Jesus is referring to these Old Testament examples as actual historical events. Right? They, these aren't just legends. 
uh, that tell about something, you know, well, there's a story about Noah and the ark and Lot. No, no, he's referring to them as actual history. This really happened in real time, in real space, that Noah, this happened, and with Lot, this happened, which we're about to talk about. These are actual historical events. So what happened in those actual historical events, and why is that important to us, uh, and why do those point to the days of the Son of Man? Well, I don't want to assume that everyone's familiar with those, so let me describe them briefly. The first involves Noah. If you're taking notes, Genesis 6 to 9 gives us the account of Noah. We're not going to read all of that this morning. That would take too long, but I will read from Genesis chapter 6 because it gives us a good summary of what was taking place on the earth in those days. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Well, what, did, what happened with Noah then? Well, God told Noah to build an ark. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Uh, he built a large boat that would spare, that in the end would be the vessel of salvation in a, in, in a sense for Noah and his family and a bunch of animals. They would go on the ark and, uh, and the floods would come. And so the floods came, wiped out everything, uh, it was God's judgment in the form of a flood. Now, Jesus is making the point that up until the floods came, everybody was just going about their daily business, just like you and I do today, right? What, what are you going to do when you leave here today? Eat lunch. All right, cool. Then what are you going to do after that? I don't know. Take a nap. Uh, I got this so I've got to do or that, and then tomorrow I'm going to get up and I've got to go to work or I'm retired, so I'm not going to work, but I've got these things on my plate. It's just our daily business, right? We have you keep a schedule. You've got a to-do list. You're going about your business. That's what the people were doing in that day. It was any other day. It was, a, I don't know what day the flood happened or started on, but let's, just, let's say it was a Wednesday or something. It was, if it was a Wednesday, it was just like any other Wednesday for them. And then all of a sudden, they're like, hey, well, the sky's getting kind of cloudy today, huh? Wonder what's going on here. Then the rains come. And actually, if you read Genesis, it says that great fountains of the deep burst forth, so probably water was coming from the ground as well. And so the, this water, the flood just came, a torrential downpour, and the whole thing's over. It's too late. Noah's in the ark with his family, and it's too late. Sudden, unexpected, catastrophic judgment that wipes out everyone else on the planet and most of the animals. Sudden, catastrophic, unexpected. Now, the other Old Testament reference here from these verses uh, in verse 28 uh, down to 29, it's strikingly similar. Right? The point Jesus is making is there's a lot of commonality here. God pours out his judgment on the wicked inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah while sparing a few that found favor in his sight, and that is Lot and his family. You can read about that in Genesis 19. Well, again, we'll go to Genesis 19 later, but not right now. In this case, it wasn't a flood that destroyed the area, but it was fire and brimstone raining from the heavens. And so this came down and destroyed uh, Sodom and, and Gomorrah, the, the town adjacent to this. What Jesus is saying is just like it had been in Noah's day, people were going about their daily business. They were just kind of doing their regular, maybe they had to go to the store that day, or they had to do this, they, I don't, they didn't have cars, so they don't go into the auto shop or whatever, but... I don't know, they got to get a hoof fixed or whatever on their animal. They're doing whatever they've got to do that day, and then all of a sudden, boom, it comes. Destroyed. Lot and his family, they get out. Two angels lead them by the hand, and they lead them out. But the judgment comes suddenly, catastrophically, unexpectedly, and it's there. And so Jesus gives us two examples. And then he turns around and he says, it will be just like this in the days of the Son of Man. How can we miss what Jesus is saying? He's given us two examples, friends. And so what he's saying is that when the king comes back to establish his kingdom, there will be a sudden, unexpected, catastrophic judgment poured out on all who have not found favor in the eyes of the Lord as Noah and Lot did. That, is, that message is loud and clear. right? I don't know how he could say it any clearer than this. 
we're not told what this judgment will look like. Other places in Scripture describe that. You read the book of Revelation, and there's all sorts of extended descriptions about God doing this and doing that. Uh, even Peter's writings, there's, there's things about uh, fire and things like that. But that's not spoken of here. That's not Jesus' point. His point is that there will be judgment coming, and it's not going to be good for those who have persisted in their rebellion against the king. That's utterly clear from the text. Judgment is coming. Now, this may seem like an odd part of the sermon to present the gospel in, but I really don't think so. I think this is actually a wonderful time for us to talk about the gospel because one of the ways that we can consider the gospel here is to think about what kind of men Noah and Lot were from their de depictions in the book of Genesis. So you say, well, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He was a wonderful guy. This, he's, a, he's like a, a, a very upright man, no flaws whatsoever, whatever. We can say the same, Lot, oh, Lot. He must have been a wonderful guy. There's nothing bad about him. Obviously, if, if that's what you're thinking, you have not read the book of Genesis. So let's talk after the flood what happens with Noah. Noah comes out of the ark. He's got, he plants a vineyard. He gets the fruit of the vineyard. He makes some wine. He gets drunk on the wine. And he exposes himself in an incredibly shameful way to his family. It's terrible. Uh, in many ways, what Moses is doing is he's drawing back to the forbidden fruit. He's pointing us back to what happened with Adam and Eve. But again, Noah, he, he shamelessly exposes himself because of his drunkenness. And then something very similar actually happens with Lot. It's interesting that Jesus chose Noah and Lot as his examples, because Lot also has a very negative experience with drunkenness, which then leads to incestuous relations with his daughters. My friends, that is not a flattering picture. I'm not making this stuff up. It's in the Bible. The Bible's uh, not a G-rated book, so to speak, and part of it is because I think God wants us to see that he loves sinners, right? These guys are messed Let me put it in common. These dudes were messed up. And God saved them anyway. Why? Because God loves sinners. God loves sinners. How do I know that God loves sinners? God loves sinners. He saves sinners. The gospel shows us that God saves sinners. Jesus Christ willingly left the comforts of the, 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 the presence of the Father. He came to earth he, he willingly lived a life in this fallen world, which that alone is much suffering. Then he subjected himself to uh, false accusations, uh, ridiculous trial uh, by people that he had created, who then gave him up to be brutally crucified, tortured, crucified. But he rose again. My friend, there's hope in that. Jesus Christ died for sinners. And so there's hope in the Lord because Jesus gave his life so that sinful people like Noah and like Lot and like Kevin could be set free from their sin, be raised to new life again. Judgment's coming, but there is hope in Christ. In Christ. All right. If you don't know Jesus, I'd love to talk to you after the sermon about this. Let's get to the, uh, the fifth lesson here from the passage. There's a fifth lesson. To be ready for the future coming of the kingdom, don't cling to this life. To be ready for the future coming of the kingdom, don't cling to this life. Verse 31. On that day, the one who was in the housetop, who was on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. Now, there's a lot of interesting questions that we could raise from that particular verse about how things are going to go down. And I don't think, I think if we bog down too far into those questions, we're going to miss Jesus' main point. His main point is there in verses 32 and 33, and that's where we want to look. So in verse 32, uh, Jesus issues a, a, a warning to his disciples. Remember Lot's wife. It's like, it's like a cryptic warning. What does that mean? Remember Lot's wife? Was it what, was it what she was wearing? What, did she just have a particular way about her or something? Why do we need to remember Lot's wife? Well, let's look at what happened to Lot's wife. Genesis chapter 19, 
We'll pick up in verse 15, and then we'll read a few, and then we'll skip down. When morning dawned, the angels turned or urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. Well, you could really camp out on that. It's a wonderful verse, actually. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Skip down then to verse 24. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But his wife, from behind him, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. See, here's the problem with Lot's wife. Lot's wife couldn't let go of the life that she had walked away from. She couldn't, in in her heart, she was still in Sodom in her heart. And so even though the, the directive was clear from the angels, whatever you do, don't look back. It's about to get really bad, and it's going to get bad for you if you look back. She couldn't get it out of her heart, and so at some point she stopped and she turned and she looked back, and she becomes a pillar of salt. And Jesus says, remember her. Remember what happened to her. Why? Verse 33, whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. My friend, that's the primary message that Jesus is saying in this part of the passage. Cling to this world and you will perish with it. Cling to this world and you will perish with it. Lose your life for Jesus in the sense that you yield it to him and you'll save it. That is what Jesus is saying here, friends. Don't cling to this life. Friends, where's your hope? Where is your heart? Are are you looking for your ultimate satisfaction in the things of this life? Or is your hope in Christ alone? Are we looking to Jesus and clinging to Him? Remember Lot's wife. Friends, judgment is coming and those who cling to this life will find that they've made a tragic mistake with eternal implications. This is obviously a very serious teaching here that Jesus is giving. Now we've got one more lesson from the text and we're done. Let's get to that last lesson from the text. When the king comes, he will distinguish between his people and everyone else. When the king comes, he will distinguish between his people and everyone else. So first let me get to the, the textual issue very briefly. And that concerns verse 36. Now, in your English translation, there may be some sort of bracket or italics or a footnote or something about verse 36 because in many ancient Greek manuscripts, verse 36, uh, that, that verse is not found there in Luke. And so it is debatable in some sense textually whether that verse uh, is actually was a part of the original manuscript in Luke. Now, let me just reassure you, if somebody's starting to freak out, Pastor Kevin deleting from our Bibles? No. It's very evident that Jesus said those words because we find them in a parallel text in Matthew's Gospel. And so we know that Jesus said the verse. The verse. It's just, did Luke write it down here, uh, or is it found in Matthew and not here? We, we don't know for sure. It, in one sense, the message is still the same because what's being said in verse 36 reinforces the exact same message of what's being said in verses 34 and 35. So in verses 34 and 35, Jesus is saying that when the king comes, he will distinguish between his people and those who are not his people. Some will be taken and some will be left. There's a distinction there. Clearly, there's a line being drawn. Physical proximity means nothing. Uh, If they're actually lying in the bed together, they're pretty close together and one is taken and one is left. Now the question then becomes, what does that mean that one is taken and one is left? And surprise, surprise, Bible scholars debate that. Uh, They debate all sorts of things. Let let me just share with you what two views are on this, and I'll kind of share with you my thoughts on it. I've always heard these verses quoted in discussions on the rapture, and if you're familiar with these verses, you've probably heard them used in that way as well. Uh, when they're cited in those discussions, what is meant is that the one that is taken is one that is saved, 
and the one being left is not saved and thus headed for judgment. And so I assume if you know those verses, that's probably what you've heard before. In the context, that very well can, could be the case. If we look at the fact that we're saying that Lot and his family were taken, they were saved, right? And Noah and his family were taken, they were saved, that would make perfect sense in the text. However, some Bible commentators uh, that I consulted point out that in this text it actually could indicate the reverse, that those who are being taken are those who are marked out for judgment, while those who are being left are the ones being spared. And the reason that they say this is because of verse 37. Uh, again, let, let me make this statement, and I've said this before from the pulpit. There are times Jesus had a three-year ministry. At times he would say the same thing in a different context, and it might have a different nuance of meaning. Verse 37 is a little bit puzzling what it means. Uh, the disciples, when they heard that, answering, they said to him, Where, Lord? It's, a, it's kind of a bizarre question. What does that mean? Where, Lord? If the sense of their question, which is probably the easiest way of understanding it, is where are they being taken, then Jesus' answer, which again, it's not easy to understand, indicates that maybe those being taken will be food for the birds. That's not a pretty picture, right? It, it, I, anytime in the Old Testament you read about people being food for the birds, that's usually a really bad thing. And so, again, it's, it's a little unclear in this specific context which is, which is the case. Are the ones being taken the ones being saved, or are the ones being taken the ones being judged? Either way, the bigger truth is still the same. When God's kingdom comes in the future, judgment is coming. And God absolutely is going to make a distinction between those who are his people and those who are not his people. That is the point that Jesus is making. Those who are his will be saved and those who are not will be subjected to his wrath. There is a very clear distinction, which brings me then to our final application this morning. What if you're a believer here this morning? What should you do with this? Well, one, it should really speak, it should be gratitude welling up in us. If Jesus is telling us it's going to get really, really bad in that day for those who are outside of Christ, and yet Noah and his crew were saved, Lot and his crew are saved, and in, in the days of the Son of Man, it's going to be exactly like that, that his people are going to be distinguished because some are going to be taken and some are going to be left, then, my friends, there should be gratitude in our hearts. God would be justified in wiping the whole thing out. If God wanted to, he absolutely could do that. And yet God willingly gave his only son so that some would be taken and some would be left. Friends, that is good news. We're not worthy of this, but God is gracious. Just like he had compassion on Lot, he has compassion on us. Now, another point of application for us this morning is that this should point us to the seriousness and the urgency of the Great Commission. I, I don't know exactly when Jesus is coming back, and neither do you, I promise you. You don't know that with, with any degree of precision. But what I can tell you is this, that the time is drawing closer. It is drawing closer. It could be very soon. It could be a little bit further. I don't know. It does appear like... It's definitely drawing closer. When Jesus returns, let's go back to our text here, there will be sudden, unexpected, catastrophic judgment on all who are not his people. Friends, that is a serious issue. And so what it should do is create a sense of urgency in our hearts that people that we love, that are outside of Christ, need to be saved. And so it should draw us more and more back to the, the, the responsibility and the privilege to point them to the Savior. Now, lastly, for the believer, this passage should be a source of comfort and hope. The king has left the building, but he's coming back. He's coming back. I, I'm guessing that on that day in December of 1956, Elvis never actually came back. In fact, the backstory on that uh, apparently Elvis had signed a contract early when he wasn't really that famous with this particular show in Louisiana that basically paid almost nothing. And by the time he rolled around to this show, he was super famous. 
He was drawing all sorts. So he wanted out of that arrangement. And so he left the building, and I'm guessing he never came back. But friends, Jesus left the building, so to speak, but he is coming back. And he's coming back for his own. Friends, let that comfort and encourage you. Life is difficult in this fallen world. We suffer and we agonize and it seems like, oh, this is not going well. This is not, whether it's in my life or in the world at large, thing, it's, it's kind of a depressing age to live in. But we can cling to the truth that the King is coming back. Jesus will return for His own. You can bank on it, friends. Let's pray. Father, there is much encouragement and hope in this if we will see it. So, Lord, give us eyes to see. Now, for those who are outside of Christ, uh, this message actually would be quite terrifying if it's taken seriously. And so, Lord, there may be one listening this morning, whether it's here or at home, and that thought troubles that person. I'm not ready for the king to return. I'm not ready for him to come back. I don't want to be one like the ones in the days of Noah or like the ones in the days of Lot. And Lord, would you hold out the hope of the gospel to that one and by your kindness draw that person to repentance. May they find hope in the Savior whose name is Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Our response hymn is Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. We'll be singing together today. So you'll stand.